Welcome everyone. My name is Joan Morgan and I am the program director for the Center for Black Visual Culture here at NYU. On behalf of myself and our director, Dr. Deborah Willis, I would like to invite you out to welcome you to today's uh, event. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, first of all, this is really exciting because this is the first event that is a two-parter and we are co-sponsoring with the Omohundro uh, Institute. And we had about 238 attendees yesterday for part one of our talk. So I want you to know that today's event, it will be closed captioned. Our theme for the culture is revolutionary reimaginings, black joy in resistance. Our other co-sponsors for this event are the 370J Project, the Department of Photography and Imaging at NYU Tisch School of the Arts and NYU Skirball Center for the Performing Arts. You can follow us on social media, I hope that you do, at CBBCIAAA. For the chat, usually if you've been in attendance with us before, we have a Q&A section. There is no Q&A section today. So what I would like you to do, since I'll be manning the Q&A at the end, is please direct your questions directly to me, Joan Morgan. I, if you leave them in the general area of the chat, there's a good chance that I won't be able to see them. So please, you can message me anytime, Joan Morgan, with your questions. And I just wanna say a quick word about our upcoming programs. Our summer, our, sorry, talks will continue next week with Kevin Adonis Brown and Harvey Neptune with the book, High Mass, Carnival and the Poetics of Caribbean Culture. And that will be next Tuesday, June 22nd at 2 p.m. And it, our series will conclude with Audrey Edwards' book, American Runaway, Black and Free in Paris in the Trump Years. That's Wednesday, June 23rd at 2 p.m. So for today, today is a continuation of yesterday's program. Part one was Dr. Jess Jessica Marie Johnson hosting Dr. Jennifer L. Morgan at the Omohundro Institute of Early American History about her forthcoming book, Reckoning with Slavery, Gender, Kinship, and Capitalism in the Early Black Atlantic. Today, Dr. Jennifer Morgan returns the favor and hosts Jessica Marie Johnson here with us at the Center for Black Visual Culture and Institute of American Affairs about her new book, Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy, and Freedom in the Atlantic World. If I'm not mistaken, Jair will put in the chat section information for you to buy these books discounted, which is always nice. So refer to the chat uh, for purchase information. So I'm gonna keep the bios of these fantastic women, both of which mean a lot to me. So I'm very grateful that they are here and sharing space with us. So Dr. Jennifer L. Morgan, is Professor of History in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis here at New York University, where she also serves as chair. She is the author of Laboring Women, Gender and Reproduction in the Making of New World Slavery. Her research examines the intersections of gender and race in the Black Atlantic world. Dr. Jessica Marie Johnson is an assistant professor in the Department of History at the John Hopkins, at John, who, I'm sorry, at the John the Sheila Biddle Ford Foundation Fellow at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Studies at Harvard University. She is also the director of Life Times, Life X Code, I think Life Times Code. You can correct me, uh, Jessica, if I'm saying this wrong. Digital Humanities Against Enclosure. So again, I want to Give a warm welcome to all of you joining us here today. Again, we have a pretty robust attendance and I will turn them over to two of my favorite, favorite minds, Dr. Jennifer Morgan and Dr. Jessica Marie Johnson. Thank you, Joan. Um, and thank you to everybody who's helped to make these two events happen so seamlessly. Um, 
if you weren't here yesterday, that's okay. We're super excited that you're here today. Um, and I am really, really thrilled to have the opportunity um, to talk with my friend and colleague, Jessica Johnson, about the extraordinary and prize-winning um, Wicked Flesh. So um, again, I would also encourage those of you, if you haven't purchased a copy to go ahead and do so. Um, Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy and Freedom in the Atlantic World. So I thought we could just start um, the way we started yesterday. And let me ask you a little bit about what you intended to do and what you feel that your work um, in Wicked Flesh has done. Sure. Um, thank you and thank you everyone who is here, who's hosting us and who is coming back for, um, for round two of this amazing conversation that I'm, really um, um, honored to be part of. Uh, with Wicked Flesh, um, Black Women Intimacy and, and Freedom in the Atlantic World, um, what I say I'm doing when I, when I talk about it um, is writing a Black feminist history of the founding of New Orleans, the founding of the Gulf Coast. Um, and that's sort of the one sentence encapsulation of the text. Uh, the more paragraph version is that it's a look at the ways that African women and women of African descent are navigating systems of slavery and colonialism as they are developing around them in the world that is the 18th century. So it begins in 1685 with the French Code Noir, which is the um, uh, uh, understood to be the first imperial slave code first slave code issued by an imperial entity, a European entity for colonies in the Americas, a wholesale colony. So it's this marker of this moment of colonialism, a kind of consolidation of, of the um, colonial mindsets um, that is also wrapped up with slavery. Uh, and it ends with the 1809-1810 expulsion of saint Domingue refugees from Cuba who left um, um, Saint Domain during the Haitian, at the end of the Haitian Revolution, during the Haitian Revolution, end up in Cuba, are expelled from Cuba, um, and end up in uh, the Gulf Coast of Louisiana. Um, and so it's a look at the ways that they are navigating and thinking about uh, freedom in a world in which freedom is um, under construction. Um, and is has these fraught tensions um, all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the 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 tensions and the, the questions that kept coming back to me um, is what do we do with um, a world of slaves that is in formation? Mm -hmm. How do we see it not in stasis, not as a thing that we can assume will look a certain way as we sort of look back at the 18th century and imagine that yes, Race, is, race looks like this, um, um, status looks like this. Um, what if we saw that as the long arc of a, of a long process and where would we position African women and women African descent in that? And where would they position themselves? Like how would they think about themselves and how would they navigate this world for themselves? And um, and then, and so we get, um, so we get Wicked Flesh, women who are um, both um, burdened with the, uh, the tensions and the struggles of uh, of major processes happening around them, geopolitical processes, processes of war and military might, but who are also creative, who are also imagining futures in which um, something different might occur, who are um, bonding and bonded to each other and who also in, in different ways are also doing doing harm and damage to each other because that's mm -hmm. that's the world that we're living in um, in that 18th century moment. So, um, so that's Wicked Flesh. Thank you so much. That's such a, that, I, I think that that really um, encapsulates the, the powerful work that you're doing in this text. And I have, I have so many questions here and I'm sure we won't get to all of them, but I think I'm going to start with like the least fair question, if that's okay. And all the rest are really, really um, totally fair, but I'm going to ask you a slightly unfair question, if you don't mind, um, which is, I wanted to ask you to talk about um, I see, I see Wicked Flesh as making a series of interventions that could really only happen, you know, now, like in 2019, 2020. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, what, um, what couldn't, what, what is it that you can do in Wicked Flesh that you couldn't have done 20 years ago? Like, what is it, what is the nature, and this is, it's a, it's a historiographical question, really. It's like, sure, what sure, is sure. the nature of the, of the field or of the kinds of questions that you um, feel compelled and also authorized to ask that you wouldn't have been able to ask um, in 1990? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. No, no, no. This is a fantastic question because it gives me a chance to um, essentially stand all the Black women historians of slavery who have set up this work, <laughs> which it does not, um, it does not exist without them. So, um, you know, most recently, um, the the work of um, Marissa Fuentes and thinking about dispossessed lives and thinking about reading along the bias grain, um, the parts of the book that are grappling with how to really kind of pull lives out of um, material that is not necessarily um, forthcoming as, as, as we discussed yesterday, like what are the ways that we can you know, think about that silence that is in the archive is actually being a character in the story and being on purpose. And so it was, it was amazing to read yours because you put into much better words the ways I was trying to think about null value as a formulation of thinking about the, the brackets in the census register or the brackets on um, the empty spaces, the kind of pregnant possibility um, and, and silences that are in the slave ship register. Mm -hmm. um, but that work is preceded by um, Marisa Fuentes' work. Um, it's preceded, of course, by Seas Subjection and, and Horton Spiller's work. Um, and it's preceded by, um, I'm sorry, Seas of Subjection and Cydia Hartman's work. And it's mm -hmm. preceded by um, Horton Spiller's work, who mm -hmm. um, is um, where the, the title derives from. So that question of what do you do um, with what we don't know about what's happening in the belly of the ship um, and what we do know, with the fundamental violences that we actually do know are occurring and how are that how is that reshaping and how are we allowing it to reshape how we think about the historical process of making gender and mm -hmm. what that becomes in the Atlantic world of making race of making what black womanhood um, emerges as mm -hmm. um, but doesn't necessarily you know is not an origin um, an origin point and I think about Spiller's Mama's Baby of course a lot um, for how it's asking us um, how it asked us then and continues to ask us to rethink and reshape how we are understanding what the domestic is, um, what are the relations of property that are wrapped up in formulations of gender as gender formations. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a, is a thread that um, I think scholars of slavery have taken up so much, but that I try and grapple with in this text, not only in thinking about the domestic, but also thinking about how we, how we as historians of slavery have really sat with and not challenge the gender binary that we're finding in archival texts. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I um, you know, wanted to kind of think with and, and, and think about how to create is what are the ways that we're thinking about histories of slavery as also disrupting um, gender binaries, as also um, attending to histories of trans and queer lives that emerge in those sort of nomenclatures later on, but of course are also existing in and of themselves in this earlier moment, but also being created in contestation um, mm -hmm. as part of uh, uh, heteronormativity being created in contestation as part of the slave ship, as part of what's happening in the belly of the whole. Um, but this text in particular, and thinking about histories of slavery and, and of Black women in slavery, um, it, it is impossible also without your work, without laboring women, without Stephanie Camp's work, and thinking mm -hmm. about geographies of containment mm -hmm. um, and the rival geographies. Um, and without Deborah Gray White's work as, you know, really kind of setting the ground for yeah. thinking about Black women in slavery, at least the U.S. context, yeah. the Library of Congress having to create a subject heading to deal with our entire women. Like, these are, like, these are formative knowledges of, of formative historiography, and it's really recent, and I don't think we always appreciate that that subject heading is 1985, 86, yeah. like, 86, yeah. we just got here, yeah. um, and there's still so much work to do, so yeah. that's just, that's just some... I think that's so, yeah, and I think two things. I, I think that that bears repeating, right? That the Library of Congress didn't have a subject heading for Deborah Gray White's book and in 1986. That is an astonishing phenomenon, you know, fact. Um, and I also, like you, and we talked about this yesterday, I think that um, the importance of Hortense Spillers to all of us, to all of us who are trying to think carefully about these processes, um, the ways in and 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 be and honor what you said at the beginning, which is we're trying to understand um, these women as as caught in something that's in formation, that it's not static, and that it makes a difference uh, whether you are enslaved in in New Orleans or in. 
uh, Charleston or in Kingston or, you know, in Port-au-Prince, like these are very significant differences. Um, and so I guess that leads me into my next question, which is I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more uh, about what we can know about sex and reproducing racial slavery by stepping outside of the English archive, which you do so powerfully and emphatically here. But I think you do two things. So first of all, obviously this is a study of the French Atlantic, but it's also, um, it's also a study that that looks um, that that occasionally you like when you talk about the Code Noir, you look back westward from uh, Louisiana to Senegal. And I thought I'd like to hear you talk about both of those things, like moving that gaze back and forth across the Atlantic, um, as well as as what you think the difference is. Um, for women who are caught in the French empire as opposed to the English empire. Sure, sure, sure. So, you know, um, it's interesting because one of the, you know, I, there's two levels in some ways that I felt I was writing into this question and that I think we think about this question. One is um, the level of, of the archive itself and what we can actually know. So the French records themselves are actually different and offer us different um, information mm -hmm. um, than uh, the English records and the Dutch records and the Spanish and Portuguese. And I feel like we say this, but I don't think we have really internalized that the French, that, that, that they're different imperial um, enclaves mm -hmm. actually offer us a different corpus of information mm -hmm. that does not necessarily mean that the experience in these places are um, you know, fundamentally different in a kind of like Tannenbaum, let's compare empires kind of way. But it it means that we actually can do a reflection on the information that is available in one place, like Louisiana's notorial records, um, and think about not that being an exception, but that refracting on experiences that might be happening in Virginia, or that might be happening in South Carolina, or in Martinique, or in Cuba, or, or other places. And so um, some of the fundamental differences in just the documentation um, is a broader documentation around um, birth, uh, birth, death, and marriage records. The involvement of the Catholic Church created a whole separate set of documents that um, generated information about kinship, information about families, um, information about godparenting. So you actually have a kind of record of chosen kin yeah. that we don't necessarily have in the English speaking world. Mm -hmm. um, and we have um, formulations, actually different institutions that are generated, that are created. And so I don't actually work in the Inquisition records, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that in the Spanish world, there is a whole set of Inquisition records. Again, this is like one of those intersections with Catholic societies. There's a whole corpus of notorial records that I'm working with along the Gulf Coast. And these documents tell us and show us um, the ways that African women and women of African descent are really fighting for each other and for themselves. They're fighting to recreate kinship networks. They're fighting to corral the resources to protect those kinship networks. And sometimes that means fighting with each other. Mm -hmm. And they're also fighting for manumission and for some imagining of a future broadly. And that future also looks different. You know, and that's one of the things I really loved about reckoning with slavery is that you take up, for instance, these big questions, breeding, infanticide, um, 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 African women in modernage, um, and remind us that it actually is, there's not a, we can't decide what's radical there. Mm -hmm. We can't decide what is free there. We can't decide what is a practice that, um, that is the right practice in a space of abject bondage and humiliation. You know, we actually have to see and witness, our job is to see and witness what are the ways that Black women are themselves just figuring it out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you get to see, I think, in these in these particular archives and records. And so that's sort of like the archival milieu for any grad students who are watching and who want to go into these archives, please do. There's amazing work to be done. Um, but then there's also kind of the live reality. So there is something different um, about being able to access God parentage as a strategy for creating chosen kin. There is, is something fundamentally different about the different ways that you're able to access a legal writ document of manumission. That does not mean that legal manumission is the um, the monument to freedom um, mm -hmm. that we have sort of understood it to be, that a manumission act, a, a legal document, freedom papers, and or emancipation now means that you've crossed somehow over to slavery to freedom and that your condition is fundamentally different. Um, there are 
serious, um, serious real differences, concrete resourcing differences, access to um, institutions that change. Um, but then there are also some really fundamental realities of, of violence that, um, that continue um, that we also haven't grappled with. And looking at th this through the perspective of African women with African descent actually helps us see that. Mm -hmm. um, these different spaces um, help us sort of, you know, grapple with what are the different ways that that looks um, as we see these institutions sort of batting against um, the determination of these women to secure some kind of safety, security, and autonomy for themselves. And that's in some ways like sort of how I try and broadly define what we sort of imagine is freedom, um, trying to kind of wrench it from its enlightenment <laughs> understanding and try and think of a way, a category of analysis, a category, category of thinking or a way of, of, of thinking about the world that might be shared, that might be the kind of, um, the, the, the root of the struggle mm -hmm. that um, Black women and, and girls are, are grappling with. Um, and it is that, it's that struggle for safety, security, um, security and autonomy. And we can see that in, in different ways um, across these different places. Yeah, and I think that what you just said about the nature of the evidence, so there's two things that are distinct here, right? One is that there are, it, it means something materially significant if you can designate a godparent and that that designation is recognized by the church the state that is a that is a meaningful and tangible difference but on the other hand you're we're also talking about the difference in like notorial practices and and in the production of evidence which shouldn't make us think that women who are enslaved in the french empire and women who are enslaved in the english empire have completely different um, practices of thinking about themselves and about the situation in which they find themselves. And I think that right. that's, that's, that's really important, really important. And it's, it, exactly. And it's also like, you know, because I think there's, I definitely think it's important to think about the institutions and the practices, but what's always revelatory to me is that these different institutions, if we reverse it, what we're looking at are opportunities for us to see how and the creativity of, of black women as they show up at these institutions and make certain demands like we can see it gives us an opening an eruption um of space that we maybe would not have had so we see more space for that in some place mm -hmm. like the francophone archives and we see mm -hmm. more space for that in some place like the um the hispanophone archives mm -hmm. um but we're actually we're not necessarily seeing um it, it, we're not necessarily it is important to think about the changing institutions and how that changes circumstances. But I'm actually really interested in how we get an opportunity to think with these women yes. and to be in conversation with them and to witness them theorizing their own condition. And we get to see, we get to witness that differently in these archives than we do in archives where those institutions are not available to sit in a notary's office and write down someone's biography in, in the route to getting somebody's um, testament um, registered at, at the same place. You know, women, we're seeing, we see over and over, I saw over and over in these archives, women who are taking these opportunities to tell their story and to write their own story of their own condition, a condition that from the moment they enter the slave ship, Mm -hmm. is presumed to have been written for them mm -hmm. and is and as you're right about like it's trying like it, europeans are trying to write this story against what they are doing mm -hmm. against the contestation that they are making and the arguments they are making uh, for their own sovereignty and their own um and their own autonomy mm -hmm. and in these archives what's exciting to me is that this we have we have opportunities to see how women have always been speaking that but mm -hmm. in this you know like but with with these particular examples that that kind of shed light on that story I, yeah, I think you just said the, this opportunity for us to see women theorizing their own condition, like that feels to me like the most um, important uh, uh, contribution that your work is making, which is to say, look at how, and I'm going to use your own language here, look at how women are practicing freedom. And I and I wanted to talk, at the, the phrase practicing freedom, the practices of freedom, like that word is clearly super important um, to you and to the process that you're trying to capture. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about practice. Yes. So I really wanted, to, as I mentioned, I really wanted to get away from, I really wanted to talk about freedom and I really wanted to talk about the tensions and ambiguities of having free status in a world of slaves. Mm -hmm. um, and I really did not want to 
fight about the enlightenment. <laughs> I did not want to have to have that conversation. I mean, I have that conversation. I feel like these are enlightenment figures. I will yeah. say that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that black women operating in the 18th century are enlightenment figures and we need to take them seriously as such. Mm-hmm. And I think the book does that. Yeah. Um, but I also did not, this is not a debate with the enlightenment. It's not a debate with the Lumiere. This is a debate. This is a, a witnessing of the ways that African women and women of African descent are always imagining something different. They're mm-hmm. always invested in worlds otherwise. Mm-hmm. And that's what the, where the practice comes from. So I did not want to um, zero in on freedom as a kind of theorization that's happening, obviously in conversation with a whole world of slavery happening somewhere in Europe. I did not, do not, and do not see um, freedom as beginning or ending with the Manumission Act or with, with, with writing on paper. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we do not see freedom as a construct in stasis that way, um, what are the ways that we can we can think about it? So one is thinking is kind of kind of trying to distill it to its most essential elements that I could see happening across all of these archives, all of these spaces, all of these women's experiences, mm-hmm. which is that battle for safety, security, and autonomy. Um, but the other is that the is that 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 battle looks different um, in different times and places. The the creativity of marshalling different tools is actually as interesting to me as what women, families, communities are fighting for. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I find that, and and I hope that in that creativity, in those practices, we actually might find ways of thinking about how we organize, um, practice freedom, um, mobilize for our communities today. And so practicing actually becomes really, really important. What are women doing, Black women doing over and over and over? Um, Sometimes because the conditions are so similar, um, because slavery has particular conditions like part of separate adventurum, so kinship is going to always be a battleground. Um, And sometimes because certain moments um, happen, um, the Spanish appearing and 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 taking over, taking um, um, ownership of Louisiana, fundamentally changes the institutions that that uh, enslaved people have access to, and change the terrain of manumission. Period. Mm-hmm. And so now there's a new practice mm-hmm. of securing a writ of manumission through notaries, of securing freedom for um, your kinfolk, of willing freedom forward um, to other family members. So the, the practice, like the 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 freedom as um, the, the creativity behind activating freedom, mm-hmm. searching for it, mm-hmm. seeking it, that, that constant movement. It, I wanted to generate movement yeah. um, and have us think about movement in this, not mm-hmm. kind of, and all the other thing, a part, of, a part about the movement piece is that it, it indexes black women's creativity, but also steps us away from this kind of presumption that freedom is a gift, you know, mm-hmm. like, am I brother, am I a man, am I a sister, or am I, or am, or am I a woman? Mm-hmm. Um, the abolitionist, you know, like kind of mm-hmm. offering freedom. Of course, we know these things are much more complex and that's not how it happened at all, but there is a kind of idea that, you know, freedom is a thing that is signed off to you. Yes. And what I'm saying is these women are free they're fighting to remind you of that mm. in the worst conditions possible, yeah. Um, yeah. not always successfully, but yeah. this is their battleground. Um, mm-hmm. And so I kind of wanted to turn that inside out. Right, that's, yeah, that's exactly. So thank you, thank you. So um, I wanna uh, talk a little bit about chapter three and about um, about uh, the middle passage and, and there's, I'm gonna quote you here. So. Uh, you write um, in one of the most um, devastating and perplex in in one of the devastating and perplexing logics of Atlantic history, um, slave traders targeted women and girls for particular and peculiar gendered violence. Um, and you and this comes at a point in the chapter in which you've introduced the Piesa de Indies, you've introduced the the kind of range of material goods that are exchanged for captives. Um, in other words, you've identified the logics of commerce. Now, obviously, you know why I'm interested in this because this is exactly what I'm interested in. Um, you and I are both um, deeply invested in unpacking the devastating logics of Atlantic sla- of Atlantic history. Uh, through understanding the simultaneity of gendered violence with commercial logic. And I I would just like you to talk a little bit more about that. Um, uh, And also there was one other place that I just thought you so brilliantly 
uh, this is on page 92 for those of you who are who are reading along. Um, you say that African women and men defied the logic that would diminish them to things, right? That they had these opportunities to defy the logic that would diminish them to things, which to me speaks back around to this business about theorizing your own condition, right? You know that the promise that what's going on here is an effort to diminish you, an effort to reduce you, and you are pushing back against it, right? So, but anyway, let's let's talk a little bit about the about the um, particular and peculiar gendered violence um, and its proximity to the logics of trade and commerce. Yes. So this chapter was, this chapter took me the longest mm. um, and was the hardest to write. And I don't think I was going to do a slave trade, slave ship chapter originally. Um, but I found that there was no way to not grapple with the hold. Mm -hmm. I'm going to think about a history of Black womanhood, and in a lot of ways, this is this is part of what this is. Not only is it an attempt to kind of think about this 18th century as as in process and in progress, but also that Black womanhood is also in process and in progress. That we actually don't know what that is, mm -hmm. um, and even in different points of the 18th century, it's not always clear what exactly that is. It begins mm -hmm. to it continues, and it's always constituting itself, changing, mm -hmm. and doing it in contestation contestation with African women, women that moved back and said, um, and I could not do that without the hold, um, the incidents and sort of and you saw you saw this in the records yourself it's like it's super it's a superimposed silence in the records of sexual violence and then it just is there <laughs> so it brings back like, there's um there's a set of um slave ship directives that are that are issued um to uh to some of the the first couple of ships that that, that go from senegambia to louisiana not the first ships of the french atlantic those are much much earlier um or the first ships that fly the french flag at least um but the uh, the first ships that land from senegambia to in louisiana in 1719 um, and part of these directives is, you know, like, you know, make sure you bring, you know, calories to, to trade for, you know, um, for, for, um, for slaves, make sure that you, um, you know, take enough rice, et cetera, et cetera, just kind of like check off, check off, check off the boxes. Mm -hmm. Also make sure that you get enough women so that, um, and make sure that the next don't debauch the women, make sure that the, the women are not raped by the, um, mm -hmm. by the, by the men. And, and you know, you, you kind of see this just sort of casually in the records and it's like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how did we get here? <laughs> We're in the middle of commercial exchanges and I didn't have your book to think with. So now I'm like thinking about this differently and I'm thinking about it in, ter in the terms of, of course we got here. Of course it had to be part of the list. You know, I think of Catherine McKittrick's work, enter the list. Of course it had to be routine and formulaic. Mm -hmm. um, of course, um, it also could not be completely ignored because it's a market strategy, right? Like you, we don't want the women um, raped and assaulted or violated because that you know hurts their bodies, which presumably lowers their market value upon landing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it, it's of course it's skewed that way. And of course, also of course, that's something that would be happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess in some ways I was also, you know, at the time, thinking about how do I write into a historiography of the slave ship, um, and I think of Shawande Mustakim's work, of course, Stephanie Smallwood's work about thinking about the Middle Passage as not actually having enough critical analysis. Um, and, so a lot, and some of that not having enoughness is not grappling with the sexual violence, um, but also not grappling with, um, and again, you do, this, you do this so good, so it's like, I wish I had this when <laughs> I wrote the book. Also not grappling with the ways that part of the value that is being placed on the women and girls who are being you know, purchased for the ship is their sexual possibility, is the possibility of their violation. Yeah. Yeah. So there's the, you know, protect their market value, don't debauch the women, but it's also, you know, pick the pretty ones. Um, pick the ones who are docile in a particular way. Pick, there's all these likely. terms, and they're not, yes, li likely. They're not all the same, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying there's a set criteria by which certain African women on the African coast are chosen or desired or marked as higher or lower value. And I'm not even um, sure that there is a particular like currency that we can apply to that, but it's part of the market thinking. And it's yeah. part of the value that is placed on them that they can be raped. 
that, that's really, really key in how they're understanding what the trade is. And we have not grappled with that. Mm -hmm. And I could not ignore that in these records. Um, I really wanted to kind of push into, um, you know, like thinking about women on the ship already is, is such important and huge work. Um, but I did not also did not want to shy away from they're being understood as reproductive subjects. They're also being understood as sexual subjects, as, mm -hmm. as bodies to be violated in a particular way mm -hmm. and bodies that are, are, are creating a particular aesthetic of femininity that is then going to be transferred as wicked, but also desirable to mm -hmm. empire mm -hmm. across the Atlantic. That that's going to be part of the marker of what is Black womanhood and what gets created, what has to be contested on the other side of the Atlantic. And that's why it became, and this other reason why it became really, really key, because it's part of the, the knowledge and the knowledge system that's being created that these women are, are going to have to fight against mm -hmm. um, later on. So, but mm -hmm. you see it, you see it deep in the continent. You see it at points of capture where mm -hmm. um, women are getting kidnapped, and we've sort of put that on. Oh, it's the labor, and and labor is more, women's labor is more desired in the continent, and mm -hmm. you know, like et cetera, et cetera. Or maybe um, what you call it? Um, I think it's Labat who talks about. Oh, the Wolof women—they're so beautiful, and they, you know, they speak French lovely, and they're beautiful dark skin. Like we put it on those things, and we've not sort of integrated into our understanding of market labor and empire is also about sexual violence and also having to find ways to justify that at the same time and that that and that commerce again like the the ways the way in which that list which you know obviously i'm like slightly obsessed with the lists um and that the list is a list of of rational practices and then there is this eruption about don't let the 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 the, the, the sailors debauch the women and then you get back to how many hogsheads of salt pork you should have, right? It's just like without skipping a beat. And I think that that's a really crucial thing that you do, you do it in this chapter, but you do it throughout, which is to say that we have to bring uh, these women's lives into proximity with these structures um, and not situate them as sort of, um, as like uh, excess, right? That in fact, so you, another, and this is the last time I'm gonna quote from this chapter, but on page 94, you say that while the gendered math of slave and commodification may have positioned female slaves as less than or deficient in the Atlantic economy, enslaved Africans exploited this same math to expose and create gaps in the security of the regime. And that, again, it's like, I think that that is such a crucial intervention that you're making here, which is to say that the mathematics are visible to the people who are being rendered into things and their refusal is a refusal of the logic of commerce right and that we need we haven't this is such an important contribution to the process of us thinking through what that means it really yeah. is it really yeah. is okay yeah. thank you thank you absolutely i mean i think that becomes so 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 critical we see it in resistance i mean one of my favorite um, stories from the, the slave ship archive, at least again, just to Senegal, to Louisiana, um, is the one where um, one of the lieutenants is, is startled when um, a troop of negresses, um, uh, he says they, he says they attack him. Mm -hmm. And so he, he, he runs, he like, you know, he, he, he runs he, off. Yeah, he runs off and he, you know, um, jumps off the ship, et cetera, tries to get away. Um, we, you know, like that's his framing. You know, when I read it, um, you know, I think about they could have attacked him. They also could have just been trying to get away. Mm -hmm. um, they were likely less um, less secure because of that kind of strange gendered logic that is also part of this mm -hmm. math of this commercial mm -hmm. world. Um, but when he reports it back, he says that he 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 runs away. He 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 runs off the ship, um, uh, uh, dies off the ship because he thinks that they're a group of men. And so there's something so, and this again speaks to speaks to me a little bit about the ways that we have not done our work also of queering this history, yeah. of thinking about the way that this gender, um, this gender thing is not a binary, that it slips and slides, um, that there are many genders in this world, all operating in, in different scales and at different levels, and that these women went from women in um, this lieutenant's estimation um, or the captain's yeah. estimation yeah. to yeah. men. And then back, and they went back because they said, "Oh no, we thought we thought the whites were going to eat us." Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm like, that could be completely true. It could also be dissembling, yeah. you know. So there's so many things that are happening, mm -hmm. and all of it to me is, if we can look at it from many different directions, but the direction I'm interested in is how these women are navigating that map, mm -hmm. navigating the map of being, you know, maybe less shackled than the ship, navigating the map of, you know, coming together. Because they mm -hmm. had to do that. They had to actually do the work of, of, of organizing themselves. Yes. 
yep. navigating the math of who is, who is left on the ship that they can overwhelm, and then navigating the math of we have been caught, now what do we say? Mm -hmm. And all of that, all of those are conscious decisions. I think we've treated them not as not as conscious decisions and as reactions to the world, as opposed to like really critical engagements with with the world that's getting created around them. Exactly. And that's the place where where our own location um, in where our own uh, presumptions about gender and gendered, uh, uh, you know, and gendered experience get in the way of our capacity to um, to imagine to recognize, not imagine, to recognize uh, women as conscious critical subjects, right? Absolutely. Exactly. So you you talked about queering and um, I want you to talk a little bit about the, the about black femme freedom uh, and, and about the notion of femme and how you use that here um, as we move past, as we move, you know, into the later chapters um, away from the middle passage and then back into the experience in Louisiana. Sure. Um, so, so much of this work and ways of thinking about and taking seriously African women and women of African descent as theorizers of their own experience is um, out of work um, that I'm indebted to from Black queer studies, from Black trans studies, um, from Black um, queer diasporic studies, beginning with Jafari Allen's many um, um, hashes, um, and um, formulations there of grappling with femme. Um, with femininity, um, with Black lesbian politic as a radical politic, um, and with what that might mean and what that might look like in an earlier period. Um, and so I want to just kind of make sure I give a shout out, of course, to the Korean Slavery Working Group, which I, you know, organized with Vanessa Holden. It was an amazing book coming out, um, yes. Surviving Southampton. Um, and also Darius Carter, who's um, Korean Slavery Remix and all the amazing work that, that he's also working on. Um, and that grappling with what, how are we thinking about um, queerness and queering, but also gender and sexuality in an earlier period? How are we thinking about other kinds of relation and relating? Mm -hmm. um, and that required a few things. So Black from Freedom is a way of thinking about um, where and how Blackness and womanhood are coming into overlapping liquid formation mm -hmm. in a particular moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's a way of taking seriously that this is something new to this world, this idea of like Blackness coming together, this idea of womanhood coming to these, that these things would you know, match up in a particular kind of way. Um, it's a way of taking seriously that for enslaved and, and free um, women of African descent, the thing that is called Black, that is this, um, you know, the common denominator of slavery and subjection and violence is also the thing that is placing them in particular relationship to each other and in particular relations to each other. Um, so Senegal, um, um, uh, Mandinka, um, Fulbe, Bamana, these are these are polities. These are whole polities. And it's one of the things I try and do is take very seriously the African context um, and that people are 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 coming across the Atlantic, are forced across the Atlantic, but have their own understandings of the world that they're bringing with them. Yeah. And we're only able to trace so much. But what we do know is that, again, it's the archive thing, that people are self-reporting their ethnicities, um, which means that they are understanding themselves of a particular relationship to a place and to a, and a policy and a worldview that is in need of knitting together mm -hmm with blackness and to become blackness. Mm. Um, so what, another way to think about this is one of the things I'm interested in is what are the ways that blackness is operationalized as a resistive practice, as a way of coming together despite and in the face of subjection, um, as another way of thinking about community that is, a, a, again, the world's otherwise, thinking of with Yomaira Figueroa's um, formulation and decolonizing diasporas, and that all of this is happening, um, and that all this is happening also getting wrapped up in the same things that are happening around what is womanhood, what is, what is gender, et cetera, et cetera. So Black Time Freedom is a way to mark that moment, um, and it's a way to mark it as that work, that radical politic of coming together, of loving each other above and beyond the excessive and violent heteronormativity, white heteronormativity of this world that is the empire, that is slavery, that is this French colonial era, um, that that's actually really, really, really important. And that it seems simple. It seems as simple as two women coming together, like as they did, like Louis Son and, and Babette come together to defend each other against a sexually harassing soldier. Mm -hmm. That seems really simple. That's incredibly radical. Yeah. That's an act of love and resistance that is 
that they risk their lives. They and die for that. And allegiance to one another. And allegiance. Yes. That's right. Yes. And that's a radical politic. And I think that is something that um, um, Black queer, Black femmes have taught us in the world, the sociality. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that is a lesson that actually we need to learn better and like really internalize better. And so Black Femme Freedom is um, is a way to kind of name that and kind of kind of capture that um, capture that moment and capture that politic also at the same time. Mm -hmm. It also is is it also was me trying to like capture a moment that is different from a later moment where Black womanhood is more related to property. Mm -hmm. And so there is something different in a later moment where you have more access to manumission, where you do have the rise of a free population of color, many of them women, mm -hmm. um, that changes relations. You know, and we see how women's relations change because they're now attending to property in a way that they weren't attending for a moment there, um, mm -hmm. at least in the Louisiana context. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. um, so Black Femme Freedom is also marking a particular, a particular difference um, that I think also, again, still, still fleshing out, even I'm still kind of thinking about, you know, what this might mean, but I do know that I see something different in the archive in this moment than, than in a later moment. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, yes, I'm, I'm totally convinced by that. Um, I see that it is 5.45, um, and I, I know, I know, I'm like, but I have so many more. So I think Joan is going to um, join us and maybe bring a question or two from the chat, uh, and then we will, um, you know, have five minutes at the end to, you know, <laughs> wrap up. Oh my God. I am going to join you with questions from the chat, but first, again, I would like to thank both uh, Jessica and Jennifer for just this, I was so privileged to be able to have this exchange and to hear you um, engage each other. I feel in conversations that you guys might be having just anyway, <laughs> which is uh, the best way to do this, so I'm I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start with the questions. I think we have enough to kind of take us to the end of time. But if you have a question that you really want to ask, address it to Joan Morgan um, privately, and I will try to get to it. Mm -hmm. So from Prita, one of the things that I find so amazing about your book is that you insist on foregrounding differences across several sites. Can you speak a little more about the challenge of working on both sides of the Atlantic? Or to put it differently, what is the challenge of working on African women and on women of African descent? Mm, such a good question. Yeah. Um, thank you, Priya. Um, and thank you so much for, um, for reading and for checking out the book. Um, so I think one of the, um, one of the differences that was really key, there were, there's two I want to kind of point to. One is that um, from the side of historiographies that grappling with the binary of slavery and freedom. Um, so in the American context, I mean, American hemispherically, the Americas, um, that binary, you know, at least seems really clear. So clear, not clear, clear. And what I'm trying to do is trouble that. I'm trying to clear it. Um, one of the things I'm trying to do is trouble that binary on that on the American side of the Atlantic. This idea that there is, again, a writ of emancipation that once you have it in hand, now you are free and that has, a, and, and all these things now attend that condition. Um, and so that's the American side. Um, on the West African context um, in particular, uh, the, that question of freedom gets really, um, really interesting because you have different ways that, that historiography has talked about what slavery is, slavery as kinlessness, slavery as, um, um, as, uh, as different mechanisms um, for navigating um, social, social belonging, which is also of course about navigation of resources, pawnship, debtor um, debtor work, et cetera, et cetera, um, navigating um, sovereignty um, and control of population. So you have, um, uh, the, uh, the royal armies, you have um, concubinage, you have all these kind of terrain in which slavery is one mechanism among many. And what Ira Berlin's formulation is that this is about society with slaves. So I mean, we probably regard the West African context as a society with slaves. Um, I think that gets a little fuzzier when you get into sort of the Atlantic littoral and these processes of slaving um, and the imposition of certain ideas of property, of numeracy, of value, of chattel that begins to kind of layer themselves over other questions of dependency. And so it was a struggle, um, and it's always a struggle grappling with that. 
being attentive to the ways that slavery is different on the African side of the story, but that the relations of property are, um, are really important to think about. And in the lives of women, those relations of property are also, prop are, are also relations, um, are also questions of intimate violence and of protection. That's why that safety, security, and autonomy piece became really, really clear is that women are grappling with, even as, as enslaved, as slaves at these comptoirs, are grappling with who is going to protect me whose household will keep me from sale across the Atlantic? Who can I claim um, or, 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 or become the godchild of um, so that I am and guarded? Um, so there's that question, and, that, and it's bodily, it's physical. So that even if you are enslaved, kafifikas, um, enslaved in one of the households, um, you might also, you, you, your everyday reality, that doesn't protect you necessarily from intimate violence as the instances in the book show. And so I think that that piece of slavery and freedom becomes really, really, um, really, really important. How do we think about that differently um, while appreciating the differences and African sovereignty over relations of, of, of property um, and questions about property and its salience, but also appreciate that that violence is, is there and is really, really key in the lives of, of everyone, and particularly in the lives of women. Um, but the other piece that I think was um, becomes really, really important um, on, on, on grappling with Black women's understandings of the world, and I let myself be very much informed by this, um, by African feminists on one side, um, Caribbean and, and um, um, African American and, and hemispheric um, Black women on the other side, is that there are also different vectors of concern when we're thinking about what are the, um, the, the critical areas of, of Black feminist thoughts. So on the Af in, in the American context, um, there is, there, again, safety, security, autonomy. There's also um, questions of, 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 of reproductive um, uh, autonomy, all of these things. Um, in the African context, you have all of those. Um, and you also have these questions of culture and tradition. And what are the ways that womanhood is or is not aligned with cultural practices, tradition pra traditional practices, which are also often layered with religious practices, particularly in this Senegambian context where Islam is so important, um, how, are those, how, how are those in alignment or not? And the struggle um, that um, uh, Senegal feminists in particular, West African feminists have had to determine their own destiny and also make a claim that this does not somehow make us Western to want to have autonomy in a particular kind of way, that to be a, you know, a, a figurehead um, or to um, have a particular kind of freedom um, to be able to determine your own destiny is also about is also an African tradition, is also a, Sen a Senegambian tradition, is also in Islam. And so there's that other piece of the struggle that I think is particular to um, a West African context. Um, and that is also something that I try and pull out about in, in the book in an earlier moment about the ways that you know, there are traditions of um, women as head of household, women as, as aristocrats, women as, as grappling with and as having control um, or wresting control away um, from Europeans um, in commerce, um, in householding, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so those are two really key pieces um, in the study. Thank you. The next question we have is from Danny Bathia. Uh, they'd like to offer a little context. The enslavement gender work reminds me so intimately of work done by Hortense Spillers, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe. Also during this Pride Month, I think one of the historical accounts we have of a Black trans woman in 1866 is named Frances Thompson, who testified about the Memphis riots and against her white assaulters in Congress. The question is, during your research, whose stories have you unearthed that radically altered your perspective about enslavement, rebellion, et cetera, in the Americas or abroad for Black women and or those I missed the last part, um, but I'm gonna jump in anyway. <laughs> I can say it again. Have, the have, question is ending, so I need to get back in here. So, <laughs> okay. During during your research, whose stories have you unearthed that radically altered your perspective about enslavement, rebellion, etc., 
in the Americas or abroad for black women and or those and or those outside of the gender binary? And I think that's a question we can pose to both Jessica and Jennifer, mm -hmm. I think. Well, that's, I'm giving it to Jessica, go. Okay. No, 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 yeah. I, um, uh, so, <laughs> you know, it's funny, like I, um, when I, when you when the question started, I thought they were going to um, um, to head over in the direction of Mary Jones, um, mm -hmm. um, who um, the the documentary artist and, and filmmaker Tourmaline um, recently did a documentary um, on, um, who was in New York in the 19th century, I think 1840s. I'm I'm blanking on the actual years, um, and who um, was um, hauled before um, the court because they were engaged in sex work um, as a woman and, um, and did that successfully for some time, um, and. Uh, got on the wrong side of the wrong um, clients um, who revealed to the court that um, uh, uh, Mary um, uh, had uh, male genitalia and had been, um, uh, anyway, um, had male genitalia. I'm the, the, the passage of the archive, this is one of the instances where the archive is not respectable of trans identity. So I'm trying to make sure I mediate my language. Um, and so that's all. That's always a case that um, that's the case I thought uh, you were going to go to, and that's a case that I think is one of the really, really important ones for thinking about some of these ways that it, it becomes really clear that uh, gender, um, the performance of gender, the embodiment of it, its representation, its understanding, are these things that slip and slide, um, and that are that that black women are aware of how they slip and slide, and are determined to secure. Um, some something for themselves, even within that slipperiness. Um, but I think, you know, <laughs> I'm going to, I, I feel like I'm going to give an unsatisfactory answer, which is that all of the women that I, um, that I meet in the archive are very much transgressive to me because they're, they are all challenging normative ideas of, of what womanhood is. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's how I read Spiller's work is that there's this normative idea of women and womanhood that Black women have never been able to be a part of, never had access to. Um, and all of them are really very much um, in conversation with challenging how we understand what um, sometimes what Blackness is. Um, and, what, and, and, so, also, and also what enslavement is, like what the experience what of being enslaved is. So it's like, I think that that's the other thing that your work does by, by, by asking questions about freedom, it's also helping us to ask questions about, uh, to be surprised by what, uh, how people are navigating their enslavement, right? And, and that, I think both of those are really important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so there are figures that I think, you know, like Mary Jones in the Louisiana Archive, I think of Francisque, um, who Sophie White has written about. I mentioned him also in my book um, and his many scarves um, and uh, the, the his performances of being part of and not part of the Louisiana community, so much so that the um, that his enslaved peers actually turned him in before the Superior Council. Um, so there are figures like that that I think can be really, really critical. Um, but I also, what I also want to, us to do is also sit with slavery's archive and let it help us challenge all of these norms um, and challenge all of the ways that we're understanding mm -hmm. um, presentation and representation and people's embodiment um, mm -hmm. and um, and let it, let it let it help us dismantle gender and turn it inside out at the same time. So I want to jump in because I think we yeah. have two minutes. Um, and so no, I, Jennifer, you have a little longer than that. It's okay. Okay, okay. Um, I just wanted to draw us to a close with uh, with focusing on the last line of your book, where you're where you're quoting um, uh, you're quoting the poet whose name I just lost in the book. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hi. Brenda Marie Osby. Okay, so, and the last line is, what is such a woman to me, right? Um, and those last words of, of the text evoke so much that's at the heart of your work, um, but it's also, it's at the heart of, it's at the heart of my work, um, that question, uh, what is such a woman to me, is, is, it fuels, I think, our, our, our time, our space in the archive, and, and so many of the scholars who you have named today and I have named um, yesterday, um, but we so rarely answer that question in the first person. 
right? And I think that one of the most powerful things that we can do now um, as historians who have published work is to answer that question in the first person. What is such a woman to me? And I am not asking you to answer the question now, but I just am acknowledging uh, that that gesture at the at, to end the work with that question um, was so moving to me. And I felt the, that it was so incredibly generative. So I just wanted to thank you for that um, and, to, and, to, and to return the gesture that you gave me so generously yesterday, which is to say that I have, I have rarely been so excited at the publication of a book because I've seen it um, as it developed and have been, had some of the most extraordinary conversations about the work of being a historian with you at various conferences. Um, and it's been an enormous pleasure uh, to see it come to this incredible fruition. So thank you. Thank you for talking with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks for having me. Um, thank you everybody who's here. I think, that's, <laughs> I think that's a beautiful way to end. So I'm going to do just that. And again, uh, to our audience, uh, deep. I, you guys are terrific. The questions are always terrific. The engagement in the chat is always terrific. I cannot thank you enough for mm -hmm. the way you show up from event to event and to these great, wonderful minds who have influenced me so much. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer Morgan. And thank you, Dr. Jessica Marie Johnson. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your attention and your time. It's been wonderful to share this time with you all. Thank you so much.